the disarmament of NATO. It's not just the disarmament of NATO from a physical standpoint. Um, NATO has lost all credibility. I mean, NATO lived off of the perception that it was this giant alliance with full of these modern armies with this modern equipment. And those Russians wouldn't dare mess with NATO because NATO had leopard tanks. NATO had M1 tanks and Challenger tanks. And, you know, we, NATO had stuff. Um, and it turns out that that stuff is garbage. Um, it also turns out that NATO armies are useless. Uh, I mean, Germany, for instance, has been exposed as nothing, literally nothing but a bunch of, you know, schnitzel eating, beer chugging, fat men who can't fight. They can't pass a physical fitness test. Uh, they can't, they haven't maintained any of their equipment. They are talking about, Germany's talking about putting together a 5,000 man brigade in Lithuania to reinforce the uh, 1,500 battalion that they have in there. <laughs> Except they don't have any tanks. You know, they're like, well, we'll send the brigade, but the we, we, we don't have, and we can't make tanks. Their, their industrial capacity has been diminished because of sanctions, because of the, the whole energy thing. And, you know, they're now paying three times as much for energy. Their factories are shutting down. They don't have any, uh, you know, forges working. They're not producing the steel, the aluminum or anything. So they can't make the tanks they need to build this magical army that they're talking about producing. Uh, when was the last time a German soldier actually put 90 pounds on his back, forced march 25 miles, and did a military task at the end under pressure? Never. Um, they just sit there. They're, they're a peacetime army of men who don't want to be there. Uh, I mean, what I mean by that is they can't get a job anywhere else. The good mechanics aren't in the German army. They're working for Mercedes. They're working for Audi. They're working for somebody else. Uh, the physically fit guys are playing sports. They're not doing this. The German army isn't, you know, a, a, a it's not a patriotic service because the Germans have forgotten what it means to be patriotic. Uh, so they have a military of, of, of men who aren't good at anything. Uh, they're definitely not good at fighting. And the German army ha has already admitted that uh, there's nothing that can stop the Russians from reaching the Oder River if they wanted to reach the Oder River. The good news for NATO is Russia doesn't want to do any of that. All Russia wants to do is be Russia. And this is the other thing that's happened here um, because Russia has redefined itself. I don't know if anybody picked up on, you know, the, the statements made earlier this year uh, by Putin and by Lavrov about the, you know, Russia's new foreign policy. And it's hinged on two things, the issue of Russian sovereignty and the issue on, on uh, Russian um uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not sustainability, but self-reliance. So basically, Russia, when Russia started the special military operation, their economy was woven in with the West, and and Russians still had this inferiority complex about, uh, well, you know, everything's better in New York, everything's better in Berlin, everything's better in Paris. <laughs> Larry, you were just in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. Everything ain't better in all these other cities. Moscow is pretty damn good. Right. Um, and Russia is pretty good. I, I was in the other parts of Russia, in you know the the cities that aren't heralded: uh, Novosibirsk, Irkutsk, Katerinburg, um, Izhevsk, Vodkinsk. Um, they're doing okay too. Yeah. Uh, they're they're doing. Russia's doing okay. It's not perfect. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that. I mean, Moscow's damn close to being perfect, but Russia is you know it's got issues. Hell, they were in the 1990s. Russia was a destroyed economy, a destroyed society. Right. It's you know Putin has been rebuilding them for 23 years successfully. But that thing that came out of this conflict is Russia has divorced itself from the West. They are done with the West. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they'll never be friends with the West. They will, but Russia will never again allow the West to be in a position where re Russia will be reliant upon them. Those days are over. This is a new Russia. This is a Russia that has said that Russia will never again be subordinated to the West culturally either. The day that the Russians go, oh, those French have better culture than us, is over. Russia has now said we are one of the major civilizations of the world, one of the major cultures of the world. This has been a, you know, the, the, a paradigm shift in terms of Russia's approach to interacting the world. This is the big thing. Defeating Ukraine was automatic. Russia was always going to defeat Ukraine. You know, the, the timing of it and how that was going to happen, you know, could be flicks. The defeat of NATO was never intended. That's NATO's fault for get, jumping in. 
But the redefinition of Russia is the biggest story here because Russia now will never back down. And there's a reason why the United States and Europe wanted to break Russia up at the end of the Soviet Union, because Russia is a huge landmass with a whole bunch of potential a whole bunch of potential. And when you combine that landmass and that potential, you create a problem that the West can't contain. So we wanted to break it up. That's over now. Russia is united. Russia is whole. And they 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 will emerge as, you know, one of the top three powers. I mean, they are already, you know, the top three powers, but they are going to be, you know, I, I remember how, you know, everybody uh, talked about, you know, Russia's just a, you know, a, a gas station with a nuclear weapon. Yeah, Blinken, Biden, they've all said it. Yep. McCain. Well, Russia ain't McCain. a gas station. Russia's, uh, Russia is one of the most diverse, culturally diverse, um, one of the most intellectually advanced, and one of the most industrially advanced. And I'll leave it at this. All the revolutions that are taking place right now on the battlefield, to give you an example, Ukrainian airplanes started dropping out of the sky where they never dropped out of the sky before. And the Ukrainians are going, what the hell happened? Well, see, Russia sat there and watched and listened. And in less than a year, was able to develop a weapon that could be fired and enter the in, into the supposed safe zone without the Ukrainians detecting it and taking out their planes. Because Russia doesn't have a defense industry that's about gouging the taxpayer. The Russian defense industry receives impetus from the field, inputs from the field, adapts and develops and then deploys and then perfects. And the Russian weapons today are all being fine-tuned to destroy Western weapons. Meanwhile, we're still putting out crap that breaks, crap that doesn't work. Um, we haven't refined anything. Larry, do you think the U.S. Army has developed a, a, a drone doctrine that has, uh, you know, <laughs> FPV drones at the uh, at the company level uh, maneuvering with, with? No. No, and if you no. ain't doing that, you're going to lose a lot of guys because that's the new face of war. And if they're you don't have to, your drone capability, you're going to lose too. Yeah, no, they're they're starting to wake up to it. But it, uh, you know, there's I'm not even sure. You know, uh, I, I spent 23 years scripting uh, terrorism exercises for JSOC, and so these were uh, these involved terrorist scenarios every uh, in all corners of the world, everything from nuclear to chem bio. Uh, and uh, conventional uh, terrorism. And we always had this process at the end, a hot wash, which was called lessons learned. And what I can say after all that time is nobody learned a damn thing. There were no lessons learned. There were did and never learned. Now, I want to go back to something that Scott said that I just to put a, a exclamation mark on it. 43 years ago, when I was teaching at American University, while trying to do a PhD, uh, I took a group of students down to the Russian embassy. And I, we met, I think, with uh, either the deputy chief of mission or the political secretary. At that time, you the, the Soviets, when these guys were Russian, they were insecure and they showed their insecurity by being, by bragging and being over, you know, what overstate things. And it was, I mean, it, it was so, evident that they doubted themselves and that was the period when you know blue jeans would be a big thing in moscow and the first mcdonald's i think got opened in like 76 77 uh why that's important is i stayed four blocks from that uh, mcdonald's restaurant it's no longer a mcdonald's gone and the dealing with russians i dealt with uh someone from the foreign minister Foreign Ministry, a, a very senior official. The confidence they have, the maturity they have, the calmness they have is really something that's it's, it's, it's enviable. You wish we had that in the United States. And I, uh, I, I'm not kidding when I say that the United States is in the process of recreating itself into the Soviet Union, the old one, while Russia is in the prospe process of making itself and to sort of the powerhouse that the United States was in the 1950s uh, because they're excelling across the board. And I think the one temptation Russia will have to avoid is what has to help destroy America. That as long as you go outside and get keep getting involved in foreign conflicts, keep butting your nose 
into other the affairs of other countries, keep spending all of your taxpayer dollars on these foreign wars, you bankrupt your country in the process. And as Scott correctly noted, you go to Moscow and everything's up to date. It's beautiful. Uh, they don't have, like in San Francisco, you can get an app which shows you where all the human beings have defecated on the sidewalks. Uh, they don't have poop mats and poop mats in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, the, you know, the streets are clean. It's big snow. People are out shoveling snow and they got a, they got machines that work it and get it picked up. So, you know, like Scott said, it's not a perfect place, but they've at least spent their money on making Russia great again. And that's, you know, that it really has happened there. And, and what's so frustrating is in the United States, in any politician, any political leader that tries to speak positively about Russia and why we should be friends with them is attacked, vilified, uh, accused of being some sort of uh, puppet of Putin. And uh, what I'm afraid of is we're, it's going to take us getting a bloody nose knocked on our ass before we may wake up and say, you know, maybe we need to talk to the Russians. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it certainly is a, a, a new McCarthyism, so to speak, uh, era here in the United States. And I wanted to get maybe your final comments uh, before we move on to something, uh, another topic on uh when I, I asked about the global ramifications of the Ukraine conflict, one of the things that's been going on is uh, Zelensky's last uh, presser, the one that you referenced, uh, that you both referenced, uh, he, he, he sounded quite down about NATO membership. But in recent weeks, there's been all of this hype on potential EU membership. And, <laughs> <laughs> and oh. it almost sounds oh. as if, this concession of just talking about Ukraine's possible EU membership is, is just another reflection of the uh, uh, strategic defeat, this uh, rot that is this project Ukraine. Um, maybe I'll let you and Scott first and then Larry to uh, comment on it. Has everybody seen that movie, Rudy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's very wonderful. You all are more I mean cultured than me. <laughs> This, yeah, this, Rudy, this, you know, Rudy, 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 you know, and he's, he's basically this, this small kid. I mean, he's got a lot of motivation, but he wants to play football for Notre Dame and he walks on and he spends every year he goes out there and he's on the, the practice squad and, and nothing. And they, they let him suit up in the end his senior year, but he's not going to play cause he's, he's not very good. He doesn't, he, he really doesn't qualify to do any of this stuff, but he gets in at the end. It's a happy ending. Ukraine is the story of Rudy with no happy ending. Yeah. Okay. The crowd can be shouting Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. But what's really going on is they're getting Rudy's hopes up. And the coach just says, no, nope, don't send them in. Nothing. Sit on the bench. Not just sit on the bench, but get him the hell off the field. Get him in the locker room. Ukraine will never be a member of the European Union. It doesn't qualify. Nobody in Europe really wants it to be. This is one of these stupid political ploys that's put out there. And I don't know why the Ukrainians and the Georgians, because the Georgians have been given the same thing. You can be a member of the EU. No, you can't, Georgia. You don't qualify. The EU is an economic union, um, not just a political union, but an economic union, which means you got to sort of have a sound economy before you can be invited in. Ukraine isn't just a, a, a body on life support. It's dead. I mean, it's there ain't nothing there. You can you can put oxygen mask on it, put an IV in. You ain't going to recover that. The Ukraine only exists when we give it money. They don't have a viable economy now. You heard Zelensky in his, in his conference about I need you know six working Ukrainians to pay taxes to pay for one soldier. Um, so in the way, who's going to give me those jobs? Because they don't have any jobs in Ukraine, they got nothing in Ukraine. Um, so there will not Ukraine will never be a member of the EU. I don't know how to say that any clearer than this. This is one of those sick things that we did with Ukraine to lure them into believing that you know, a they could be a member of NATO. Now, no, I said when that is, they don't qualify to be NATO. They will never be a member of NATO ever. Well, I think everybody recognizes that now. So now they're putting out that last bit of hope. You know, you can be a member of the EU. We'll fast track you into what? Fast track into what? Membership? No. 
This is the talks. We're fast tracking you into talks, which means we're going to drag it up. This is part of this is like watching a cat play with a mouse before it eats it. It's just sad, but it's 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 Rudy with no happy ending. Hey, remember that uh, Turk, the E voted to let Turkey in too. The accession talks. That's about 21, 22 years ago. They're still waiting. It took Ireland. Think about this. Ireland, I mean, a bunch of people like to drink a bit. You know, took them 20 years to get in. So, <laughs> you know, the notion that Ukraine's going to be bum-rushed through the door, you know, that's not happening. Yeah, but the other, you, you know, I think Russia was surprised by the special military operation on several fronts. One, you know, the weakening of the weakening and potential destruction of NATO is one. But then it really gave the impetus for BRICS and the rise of, of uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, creating an alternative economic system outside of the, you know, U.S. dollar denominated reserve system. Uh, and, and we're seeing, you know, this week the United States thinks it's being cute that, oh, we're going to pass a law and we're going to take that $300 billion that we stole from Russia. We're going to give it to Ukraine. Boy, that'll be a game changer for them. <laughs> yeah, it, it might mean that, you know, Zelensky can buy more cocaine. OK, but um, apart from that, that it's what the message it sends to the rest of the world is. If we do business in U.S. dollars, this United States can take our money anytime they want. And there, there's nothing we can do about it. So why would we want to get ourselves hooked into that kind of system when we can join BRICS and deal in our own currency? And so it's a fundamental change in the international economic order, the, 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 the new world order created in the wake of World War II, with the International Monetary Fund, the Bretton Woods Agreement, the World Bank, the United Nations, all of that's coming apart. And the traditional U.S. leadership in that is crumbling. It's being dramatically eroded. And that's what one of the things I think Russia awakened, you know, it awoke to. It realized, as Scott said earlier, we don't need these guys. We're, we're our own person. We can do our own thing. Now, to that point, if we want to have a relationship with them, we'll do that. But, uh, you know, they're sort of like this uh, spouse in an abusive relationship that's realized, hey, I can get away from the wife beater and I don't have to put up with that crap anymore. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I mean, the the world has changed quite dramatically since February 2022, but even in, in the last year. Uh, Larry, you were just in Russia. I know, Scott, you've been. Um, we're talking about economic growth in Russia despite these sanctions. I mean, the massive number of sanctions, uh, 2023 seems to be the year where it has become very clear. If it wasn't clear in 2022, it is very clear in 2023 that three and a half, uh, everything. Three and a half percent. Three and a half yeah. percent growth right now in Russia. Growth. It's incredible. I have a, I video, mean, I have a video from a friend of mine who... Um, was at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum earlier this summer. And he, he was walking around and he just sends this video and he's showing all the, the pavilions and everything. And then he just turns and he goes, thank you, Joe Biden. Because <laughs> I mean, it's the greatest success that out there. Um, These the, the sanctions have just backfired like you wouldn't believe. It, it what, again, Larry knows this. Danny, you know this well. I ain't an economist, okay? I'm a very simple guy. I'm not, you know, one of these uh, G whiz, you know, McNamara's G whiz guys that's good with numbers and all that stuff. But in December of 2021, I wrote an article that said, if they try to sanction Russia, it will backfire and be the end. Because I know enough about gas stations to know that if you've got a big old, you know, Humvee that chugs diesel, um, you need a gas station that sells diesel um, at an affordable price. And um, Europe was this big old Humvee that chugs diesel, and Russia supplied the diesel. And by sanctioning Russia, they cut off the diesel supply. 
And now the Humvee's out of fuel. It don't work. It's sitting in the corner rusting, falling apart because there's no spare parts. Um, a Marine can understand that. You don't have to be an economist to understand that. Europe shot itself in the foot with these sanctions. Russia, meanwhile, was liberated from the oligarchs. Um, they're, all the money the oligarchs were taking out of Russia now stays in Russia, reinvested in Russia. Um, every city I went to, and, and Larry, I think Moscow was the same. Was that way in May? You probably saw cranes on the skyline. Yeah. Yeah. Building, 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 building. They, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a growth economy at a time when the West is still, I think the EU just passed their 14th round of sanctions or something like that. I mean, the first 13 were so good, they had to go to 14. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, get, uh, the book that needs to be written is it'll be a short book uh, <laughs> where, where economic sanctions worked. Yeah, I, I, I would challenge anybody to cite me a single example in history where a country imposed economics, in particular economic sanctions, on another country, and it compelled that country to both either change its policies or change its political leadership or both. Yeah. Not a thing. I mean, the United States keeps trying it over and over and over. And what happens? Cuba? Iran? You know, Russia. Iraq. Looks strong yeah, Iraq. right now. Venezuela looks strong. And, yeah. and it's not a strong country <laughs> normally, but it is. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's changing. Syria, so, too. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was never asked to write this when I was at CIA, but. You know, somebody said, hey, can, give us an assessment. Can sanctions work? And, you'd, and I said, it would be a pretty brief, succinct paper. No, they don't. Don't do it. Find something else. Well, sanctions is, is, is it's not a policy. It's the lack of policy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What say, when, when we impose sanctions, what we're saying is we don't know what to do. And so we're going to punt. We're going to put sanctions in place uh, to buy time, to look like we're doing something, while we do nothing. Meanwhile, all we do is end up isolating ourselves further. Our strength came from the, the fact that we dominated the global economic system. And the only way you continue to dominate is by having people buy into it, you know, right. and, then, and then they buy into it. Now you can, if you're smart, you manipulate on the sidelines. You don't do the big thing because you want them to continue to buy into it. You want them to keep coming. You want them to keep signing up, get more subscribers, um, but manipulate on the sideline, control indirectly. And if you're clever, you own the whole world. No, we'll see. Politically, we can't do that because we have to have Marco Rubio and uh, you know uh, Ted Cruz and all these other idiots. Um, you know, we're strong. We're America. Uh, like Tony Blink. We. <laughs> I know we might get to China, but you know, we can only deal with China from a position of strength. Really? Um, how about just yeah. dealing with China? That would be nice. But the, the point is we screwed up because we sanctioned everybody and they end up saying, well, we don't want to play anymore. What do you think is going to happen, Larry, when they take $300 billion from Russia? Because yeah. up until now, we've had Janet Yellen and others say, we can't do that because that's illegal. Uh, and, and, and Russia is going to put, you know, Russia will take back uh, loans that uh, U.S. companies were expected to be repaid. That Russia will just confiscate. I mean, they got three hundred billion dollars worth of infrastructure in there. They'll just nationalize. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it, uh, it's foolish. And it also means that nobody's ever going to want the dollar again or the euro again. Yeah. Which is happening right now. That's what the whole impetus behind de-dollarization isn't that the dollar is a weak currency. Actually, the dollar on the international trade is a very strong currency. Uh, look at it. When you trade in the dollar, you don't have any of this messy currency exchange rates and this complication. Uh, things happen smoothly because everybody's using the same currency. How stupid were we to end that system? What we've done now, though, is make the dollar a, a, a suicide pill because now, you know, swift. I can't, you know, I can't do, I'm a sovereign nation. I want to do something, but I can't now because my my dollars touched the, or or a dollar I use touched the banking system. So now the U.S. government can come and tell me what to do. I mean, the, the arrogance of the Congress to say, if you touch a dollar, we own you. And then we say, we want everybody to have their, their, their you know, fiscal, their, their reserves 
uh, in dollars and euros, again, because of the ease of commerce. And we, we put them in banks so that things are convenient, things are fast, the transactions, and then we seize them. And people are going to go, well, you know, I know it's inconvenient for me to trade with uh, Renbin and, 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 uh, and rupees, but ain't nobody going to be seizing my money. Uh, America has basically navigated itself out of a winning position. We were controlling the world because we had a system in place that enabled us to control the world with very little effort. And we've thrown that away because of sanctions, this arrogance, et cetera. And the world will never go. BRICS, BRICS was a was a Division Three football team a, you know, a couple of years ago. They weren't very, you know, it was like BRICS, the potential of BRICS. Maybe someday they'll grow up. Bam, instant, instant adulthood. Not because BRICS suddenly, you know, blossomed, because America became such a bad option. That everybody went, got anything else out there? Bricks. And look, bricks had to grow up quick. The South Africa uh, summit they had, that was that was called rapid adulthood, where they had to come in. They talked about expanding. Russia's taking over bricks on January 24th. They're going to expand and even expand more. They're off to the races now. Um, good job, America. Good job, yep. Tony Blake. Well, you know, one other thing on this, that America really is like poked one of its eyes out when it uh, pushed Russia off swift. Because why, why is that? Well, if you're transacting in dollars, any transaction in dollars going through SWIFT is going through the United States electronically, which means that NSA can pick that up and monitor every single transaction. <laughs> so now what we've done is, uh, well, we're not going to look any. We've just po poked our eyes out so Russia can go do, uh, <laughs> you know, if it was engaged with some skullduggery with its money. We're not going to see it now. And I mean, that's a, another self-inflicted wound. Just It just shows how stupid and short-sighted these people are. They just, uh, they, they want just to do things. To yeah, build on what Larry just said, um, tankers, old tankers. You know, Russia's built this ghost fleet. I have to laugh about this because if you remember the arrogance, we're going to put a cap on Russian oil. Yeah. Really? Oh, they're doubling yeah. down on that. Supposedly, uh, that's we're gonna what I'm we're gonna deny Ru we're gonna deny Russia insurance, really. And you don't think Russia has a plan? So Russia went out and bought all the old tankers in the world, and they filled them up with oil. And and now we don't know because they bought them not with dollars, they bought them on the market on a market that we don't control anymore. We have no clue how many tankers Russia has and is operating. We have no idea what's going on. All these people that used to run the, the world oil thing and, you know, oh, I could predict the price. You can't they, you know, because they don't know what Russia is doing. They have no clue what Russia is doing because half of what Russia is doing right now is being reported in channels that the NSA isn't collecting on anymore because we've we've allowed Russia to unplug from the, the known knowables. So... We are, this This is my, my frustration with people who are supposed to be experts in the energy security business. They haven't a clue about Russia. They don't know anything about Russia. They, they claim they don't need to know anything about Russia. They don't want to know. And this is why Russia is running circles around us, because Russia knows everything about us. Russia is very knowledgeable about who we are and what we are. That's why Russia is so patient. Do you see any panic from Russia? Larry, did you see any panic? No, no panic. Well, There's calm. nothing but panic in Washington, D.C. Nothing but panic. Why? Because they have no clue what's going on. They literally have no clue. All they'd have to do is pick up the phone and call the Russian ambassador, Anatoly Antonov, and talk. And he, he'd be more than happy to. But we don't allow anybody to engage with him. We've got nobody in State Department having connectivity with Moscow. I mean, Moscow used to have one of the biggest North American bureaus out there, you know, in the foreign in the foreign ministry. A whole bunch of experts on America who would pick up the phone and talk to their American counterparts when problems need to be solved. America hasn't made these phone calls, so they're redistributing these people. Um, and Russia doesn't care. Russia's like, you don't want to talk to us? That's okay. Chinese want to talk to us. Indians want to talk to us. Africa wants to talk to us. The whole world wants to talk to us. America doesn't want to talk to us? No problem. And suddenly now America's going, Oh, we might want to talk to the Russians. I'm sorry. The party you're calling doesn't really want to talk to you ever again. You know, and that's the reality. 
we've blown it with Russia. We have truly blown it. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash dannyhaifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video. Thank you.